What a mighty God we serve. 31 years of doing anything is worthy to be celebrated. I want to honor your amazing man of God for holding forth and fast. There's so many pastors who couldn't make it three weeks, others three years, some three months, but 31 years. You are, in fact, the litmus test of what it means to have stick to and internal fortitude. The soundtrack of your ministry has got to be, I had some good days and some bad days, but I won't complain. To all of you from the Grove in Portsmouth, Virginia, Tidewater, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and around the world, you ought to know that even in a quarantine that we can say with unshaken faith, God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. I'm humbled and honored that you would invite me to be a part of this amazing hallmark occasion. Uh, I regret, regret for obvious reasons that I can't be with you physically, uh, but I'm grateful that God would use this technological platform for us to be able to worship together. I want to go, if I can, to Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter 2. And in Nehemiah chapter 2, I want to uh, look at uh, verses 1 through 6. Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, uh, holds and houses, comprises of uh, the full breadth and spans of our text for tonight. Uh, but I want to zoom in our semantic spotlight on uh, verse number 2 and 3. Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not sick? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid. But I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my family is buried is now in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. I want to preach uh, tonight, even on a Wednesday night, I want to preach using it as a subject, he shall supply all the money I need. He shall supply all the money that I need. Sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove, Stay right here with us, filling us with your love. Now, for all of these blessings, we thank you in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. He shall supply all the money that you need. My dear friends, I've noted that the biggest building in most major cities are usually owned by banking institutions or insurance companies. Banks and insurance companies don't know how to become comfortable in doing things small. Significance is usually connected to size. Isn't it amazing that God never directed Noah to construct a rowboat? He didn't take the children of Israel across a pond, but he brought them across a sea. The anointed among us have a big vision. There's something significant that you want to do. A dream house is never an apartment. Your ideal car is not eco-friendly. Your entrepreneurial enterprise doesn't envision minimal patronage. The degree you aspire to is not offered in a free workshop. The trip you want to make is not to Virginia Beach or Ocean City. I want to tell you there's a big price associated with your conquest. Whatever you want to conquer, 
Traditional financial corporations are not interested right now in taking a risk on something as big as what you pray for. The only problem of what's on your heart that God planted there is not safe, it's not in reason, and it's not in budget. As a consequence, you can write out the best business plan, find the best home, pick out the best car, and the branch manager who is assigned to assess your dream is going to ask you a battery of questions. That branch manager at your local bank is going to ask you, number one, how much money do you need? Number two, the branch manager is wanting uh, to know, what are you going to do with that said money if we give it to you? Number three, they want to know, what will you do, here it is, if you don't get the loan? Will you be discouraged because you got rejected? Fourthly, they want to find out how will you pay it back and how long is it going to take you to pay it back? With America's credit being the worst it's ever been, please, whatever you do, don't deposit your dreams into the bank of safety. Your idea, your dream, your concept, your vision, your vacation, your education, your residence, whatever it is that's on your mind, can I say this to you? If God gave it to you, you don't have the money for it. God put it in your heart. You don't know where to get it. And oft times we are found chanting, quoting, singing, and he will supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. I want to remix that tonight. And I want to say to you what I heard heaven declare to me. And he will supply all the money you need. That should have brought a quickening to your spirit right there. And he will supply all the money you need. If you don't need none, don't say it with us. But if your faith resonates with this declaration, I want you to shout it around your house and I want you to type it on the screen. And he will supply all the money I need. He's going to do it. So I can get my kids the tutoring they need. So I can get my parents the health and medical assistance that is required. He's going to do it so that I don't have to be afraid of starting over. He's going to do it because he knows I can't tolerate them at that job talking to me any kind of way. He's going to do it because unemployment ran out last week. He's going to supply all the money that you need. In Nehemiah's first chapter, Nehemiah gets word from his brother who sends him a text message that everything in the old neighborhood is falling apart. Not only are things falling apart, but the people are in danger. They're all living in Section 8 housing. The police are shooting people seven times in the back and not going to jail. People are working full-time jobs and then go home and go to bed and then being shot up in their own home without ever there being an offense. And in Nehemiah chapter 1, we understand that the month in which uh, he gets this report is November. Turn the page. We're now in chapter 2. Nehemiah has been holding this since November and is now April. So he has heard the report and it has sat on him for five months and he couldn't do anything about it. I'm talking to those of you 
who are harboring and nesting a dream that is not new. An idea that was not just hatched this morning. A prospect that you didn't just wake up with. You've been dealing with it for months. And God told me to tell you, I don't care how many months, how many weeks, how many years you have been holding on to your idea, your dream, your vision, your plan, your passion, your assignment, your gift. It couldn't happen until September. Because September is the ninth month. And every mother knows that nine is the number that everything that's in you has got to come out of you. I want you to know that what you're going through right now is not um, warfare, it's just labor pains. That you have the benefit on the 2nd of September to feel something kick. It's not kicking you out of position. It's not kicking you out of place. It is kicking you into your rightful posture so that you would understand what I'm carrying is not mine. And because it's not mine, God got to take the bill. I didn't ask for this. Can I say this out loud? I didn't pray for this. And for those of y'all that are keep it 100, I don't even, for real, for real, I don't even really want this. But now I'm carrying it, and I'm going full term with it. And Nehemiah gets this message from his brother in chapter 1 that everything in the old neighborhood is falling apart. Everything looks a mess. It's dilapidating. It's condemned. It ought to be knocked over. People are living in squalor camps, barely making it, fighting to survive not knowing how they're going to feed themselves, how they're going to keep themselves above water. And Nehemiah has got to wrestle with it for five months and talk to nobody about it. Have you ever been there? Where you had to go through something and nobody around you understood the pain that you carry. Nobody could identify with the weight that is on your shoulders. Nobody could really sympathize or empathize because you don't even know how to talk about it or articulate. You don't even really sleep. You just lay there. And Nehemiah, I want you to see what happens to him for five months. I don't know what his pulse rate, I don't know what his cholesterol, what his blood pressure is. I don't know anything about his sleep pattern. All I know is that he's holding it for five months. And doing his job. It is an uncomfortable, unsettling uh, thing that you have to grapple with when you got to stay focused when your mind is somewhere else. Well, you got to do what you got to do until you can do what you want to do. And Nehemiah serves as a cupbearer. I want you to get this in your mind. Nehemiah's only job is to pour drinks for the king. And not only does he have to pour drinks for the king, hear this, he's got to taste it before the king tastes it just to ensure there's no poison in it. The king is paranoid, hear this, because he doesn't want what happened to his father to happen to him. Somebody, I hope that you got on shouting slippers. Because God sent me here tonight just to tell you, whatever was the lot of your father will not be yours. Your father is not going to, in fact, have the better testimony than you. You are not going to die prematurely. You are not going to be in a drunken stupor. You are not going to have unbridled anger management. You are not going to always be in transition and find no stability. The curse of your father is broken over your life. You are not going to drink his poison. And so now Nehemiah has got to work for somebody who's living in paranoia of generational curses. And he's got to pour and he's got to taste. 
Nelson Mandela, the former president of South Africa, said something uh, in his book, Long Walk to Freedom. Watch what he says in his autobiography. He said, unforgiveness is drinking poison, hoping the other person dies. Unforgiveness is drinking poison, hoping somebody else dies. Nehemiah has got to serve this king not knowing what was meant to kill the king could kill him. You are not going to let your job kill you. The stress of your place of employment is not going to snatch your vitality. What you do is not who you are. Your identity is greater than your check. You have to have the self-awareness and self-esteem enough to be able to walk in the authority. This job don't make me. I was anointed before I got here. I'll be anointed in the event that I have to leave. He serves the king wine. And biblically, we know that wine is a metaphor for joy. Hear this. I want you to catch this. He is serving joy but has sadness on his face. He doesn't feel like what he's assigned to. Preach Jamal, I'm trying. He doesn't feel like what he's assigned to. If he's pouring joy, he should be filled with joy. But this man, here it is, has got a bad taste in his mouth because in something he should be happy in, he is stricken with stress about. I'm trying to figure out when did you lose your happiness? When did your work become a weight? When did you turn in your dream for stability? When did you wave the white flag to stop fighting for what you were called to do? It was illegal for you to be sad in the presence of the king. We're in virtual church now, but I wonder how many people would be thrown out of church if we were still under monarchial law that you can't look sad in the presence of the king. In the presence of the king, there's got to be fullness of joy. And the king asked him, Nehemiah, what's wrong with you? And Nehemiah says, no, sir, I don't want you to get it wrong. It ain't. Uh, that I'm upset about working here at the palace. I like serving you. I'm grateful to be this close. I'm appreciative to be able to pour joy. I need you to hear the words and the sentiment of Nehemiah. My problem, y'all ain't gonna like it, is not where I work. I'm stressed about what's happening at home. My house is falling apart. My children are acting crazy. My marriage is holding on by the hair of my chinny chin chin. I hate going home. Home has become a hospice and it makes me sick. That's where my centerpiece and the epicenter of my discontentment is at home. Do you know how many people who go to your church don't like home? Do you know how many people who are engaged in ministry don't like home? Do you know how hard it is for preachers to preach folk into heaven when they got hell at home? Do you know what it's like to be sentenced to your own mattress? Do you know how many people are now filing divorce because of COVID-19? They are stuck at home says, I'm worried about being at home and I'm carrying something. This burden, this worry, this stress, this anxiety, this pain, this nagging thought is bothering me even at work. And I can't fix it here. The vision that you're carrying right now, friends, is influencing your emotions. It's impacting your feelings. It's disrupting your heart rate. It is, in fact, trespassing against your sleep. And you're carrying it. 
And watch what the king says to Nehemiah is what I am responsible to preach to you tonight. The king sounds like a bank manager. Watch what the king says. What do you want? <laughs> How much do you need? What you going to do if I give it to you? How much time do you need to get it done? That's what the king said to Nehemiah. That's what the bank manager says to the applicant. And that's what God is saying to you tonight. What do you want? How much do you need? What you going to do with it when I give it to you? How much time is it going to take you to get it done? And the Bible says that after the king asked Nehemiah of that, then immediately Nehemiah prayed. That's what I want you to start praying right now. I want you to begin praying. Here it is in earnest and in full disclosure. How much money do you need God to supply? I want you to begin praying right there. If he gives it to you, what you going to do with it? I want you to begin praying. How much time do you need to get it accomplished? Come on, I want you to pray right where you are. Some of you know right off the top of your head how much money you need in order for you to get back on your feet. I don't want you to pay the stuff down. I want you to pay it off. I want you to begin praying right now. Believing by faith. God, if you give me this, I promise you, I'm going to be a good steward for it. And the king says, I'm going to give you what you need. Here it is. To rebuild your home. To rebuild your family. To rebuild your business. To rebuild your idea. Can I say this? To rebuild your ministry. And he asked him a critical question that I feel encumbered to ask you tonight. When do you want it finished? It is the very first and only time that the king asked a humble peasant to set the deadline. I'm asking you, Oak Church, set the deadline. When are you expecting God to do it? Set the deadline. It's September 2nd. Set the deadline. When you're moving out that apartment. When you're having a grand opening for your business. When is going to be your book signing? Set the deadline. When are you setting the date for the marriage? Set the deadline. God says, whatever it is that you want, I'm going to pay for it. And then the king says something, and I almost feel like crying right through here. The king says to him, I'm going to give you all the money you need, but I'm not just going to give you money. Watch what the king says to Nehemiah. And I, in turn, say to you, I'm not just going to give you money. I am assigning troops to surround you so that while you are rebuilding, preach Jamal, there'll be no attacks. I speak it over your life that while you are in the middle of rebuilding your life, rebuilding your family, rebuilding your marriage, there will be no attacks. Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. I am calling for a moratorium on all satanic activity aimed at your idea, your household, your children, and your health. Says, I need to give you the money. That's what the king says to Nehemiah. I'm giving you the money to protect your family. I'm giving you the money so that the walls are going to be restored. I'm giving you the money, here it is, so that you'll have houses that you did not build. It's my last point. My time is almost up. Amazingly, you skipped and hopscotch over the critical point of the text. Nehemiah is not a construction worker. Nehemiah, hear this, is just a butler. And the king trusted him with money 
to do something he had no training in. God is going to give you money and then surround you with the people who have the expertise to be able to get it done. God is getting ready to supply all the money that you need. I mean that for your pastor. I mean that for your church. I mean that for your city. And I mean that for your home. While you're in front of that computer, I want you to lift up that hand. I want to pray for you that you will actualize everything that I have uttered on this night. God, do it. You can do anything but fail. God, give them all the money that they need so that they can rebuild, so that they can move on, so that they might have closure. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.